Welcome to Geek Salad, a podcast about two guys talking about their passion for anything geek, from the digital world to the not so digital world. Now here are your hosts, Randy and Jay A. Larock. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 10 of Geek Salad. It is me, Randy, hosting today with my good old friend Jay A. Larock. What's up, Jay A? What's up? It's a special, special special episode 10. Yes. Um, with us today, um, we have, for me, one of probably my uh, favorite right now board game designers, um, Mr. Jamie Stonemeyer from uh, uh, Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Games. Welcome, Jamie. Hey, Randy. Thank- yeah, a lot of people make that. that we we've chosen a confusing name, so that happens all the time. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having me. Oh no! Thank you for coming on. Um, I I have to say, um, huge fan of all your games. Um, essentially, own four of the five games that you have released from Stonemaier Games. Uh, oh. Only one that I have not played has been Between Two Cities, but I hear amazing things about it. Um, it's funny because when looking at the games, I realize like, oh, every single one of the games that I own, you've actually <laughs> designed <laughs> in the games. Um, and as I link you the video to the Charter Stone as well as the side, like with every single game that my wife and I and my friends and I have played, it's just been getting better and better with every single one. Um, and yeah. I will, I will definitely say when you guys made the announcement of the next expansion for Scythe, you you had me drooling already when it was like, oh, you're adding a legacy component to it. I was just like, how could this be? So. I'm really looking forward to that. That's for sure. Well, it's not. I should clarify. It's not quite legacy. It has elements of discovery, but not permanence. Ah, okay. So there's an ongoing campaign where there are like persistent elements in the campaign, but there's nothing permanent that you can't undo. So you could do the same campaign campaign with different people, and you can reset everything. Excellent. But it will feel like a legacy game, just not with permanence. Right. Um, which I will say this: the way that you did the legacy element of Charterstone is unbelievable just how that came about thanks yeah yeah um so my first question to you um when you go through the whole like development uh process of a game itself like what are the steps that you take like what makes you uh choose i want to go with this element or that element yeah that's a i mean i that's a good question that i ask myself throughout the process so it starts with just brainstorming like right now on my desk i'm, I'm brainstorming for a game so just like Oh, wow. pencil and paper like just ideas that i have that are coming together um and during that process it's it's all hypothetical right you know i have some ideas i have some things that i think will be fun or not fun or interesting or thematic or not thematic and i i try to get it all to make sense then when i enter the prototype stage and i try to make the first prototype i ask myself those same questions again mm-hmm. um like what what does does the, the does the user interface of this element work does this make sense can i actually convey this in a way that isn't too verbose on the cards or the the board, um, and then I ask myself at, at every playtest and after every playtest, uh, and usually in the end after I get to the playtest stage, it's about um, is this intuitive and is this fun? Because if something isn't intuitive, then it's going to be hard to teach. It's going to be hard to remember. Mm-hmm. And even if a mechanism or a thematic element is interesting, but it's not actually fun in the end, then I do try to tweak it so it does actually. Players can actually have fun with it. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Weird. It's like it's almost like you're thinking of like what maybe when an author is creating a world for a book, but except you have to make it so that someone can play in your world, which just ups that level of difficulty tenfold, maybe a hundredfold. Yeah, I, I imagine maybe um, movie directors might encounter that when they take like a, a Lord of the Rings type world, right? They take a world, but then they have to have to actually make it look and feel real with real with people walking around in that world i bet they encounter some stuff where in the book it's described one way and they're like well this just doesn't this can't come to reality this can't actually be yeah same same process um my my next question would be is how do you decide on like a theme for for your game yeah that it depends on the game um it's changed for every one of them like for viticulture my first entry into the the board gaming world I wanted to pick a theme that I thought would appeal to gamers and non-gamers alike. Um, and so I thought like the romanticized idea of running a vineyard would be good for that. With uh, with Euphoria, 
the idea stemmed from me wondering like, okay, with all these worker placement games that are out there, what if the, like, why are the workers just doing whatever we tell them to? Why don't they ever resist? And so I thought, okay, I could either make a game that's about workers resisting, but I came to the, the conclusion that that wouldn't be all that fun. It might work in some designs, but I couldn't figure it out. To the other side of like, what is the thematic world where workers don't question you and they just blindly and ignorantly go along with whatever you tell them to do? And in that case, I thought, okay, that fits the, a dystopian theme would fit that well. Mm -hmm. With, with Psy, there was an existing world, uh, or at least one that was started to be created by the artist, Jakob Rosalski. He had started to create that world and I was really drawn to it. Um, and then Charterstone, Charterstone was kind of, it stemmed from my, my love of legacy games, but also my love of Euro games. I wanted to mix, the two, mix the two together. And it, uh, just seemed to make sense that like, uh, starting and running a village would be a good theme for that. I thought that would be a nice addition to the the legacy games that are already out there. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. One what kind of themes you... are you guys drawn to in games? Is there any themes where if you see a game that has this theme, you're like, oh yeah, I, I need to at least learn more about it. Uh, I, I will say for me, like Scythe, seeing the artwork in Scythe, was like right away the first thing that drew me towards it. Cause I was looking at it, I was like, wow, like the artist really captured such emotions, such really great like drama yeah. in the artwork. And then finding like sitting down and playing the game was just like, wow, this really like fits that like the, the artwork so well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you say the way that you developed your your games. What was funny is I actually went from Viticulture to Euphoria oh, to did. Charterstone to then Side. Okay. okay. And what's interesting is like playing Viticulture and then playing Euphoria. It was interesting to see like oh there are these like little elements that carry over that are similar, <laughs> but then it's like completely different. And yeah. one of the things that I I loved about Viticulture is it's like oh it's your worker placement game. But you had to choose, like, do I place my guys in this season or wait for later? Like, right. that layer of strategy in it was just amazing. And I was like, wow, no one's ever done something like that. We're like, oh, I'm going to throw all my players. I was like, oh, wait, I can't do anything else. Right. So the right. next one. Um, and even with the the Tuscany expansion, which added even more seasons to it, right. I thought was amazing. Um, and then Euphoria, what got me with that was I started to play it. And then the whole using dice mm -hmm. as your workers and the whole like you had to roll dice. It was funny because when you look at worker placement games, the first thing that everybody always says when you're playing, you're like, get as many people as you can because that way you can do more action. And then you're like, oh, wait, I can't do that because they'll leave me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was really funny to watch my friends that were used to doing that start getting people. And then they roll and they're like, oh, two of my guys left. <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, you got to think, pace yourself. <laughs> right, right. Um, jumping it's funny. Then, for, um, for me, um, I'm I'm still a novice when it comes to board games, tabletop games. Uh, I started off, you know, playing a little bit of the Dungeons and Dragons like pen and paper, but then I got into video games, and then as more people start playing board games as well, I got into it. For me, I like something that you can build a story on, whether there's a built-in story or you use your own imagination to help uh, supplement the story. Like things like that to me, you know, really draw me in. And to that point, I I just wanted to ask, going back to like the analogy with like movies and books is there a, a process where you have to work between i want to make this type of game because i like the features i like the story i like the world but it also needs to be profitable because i feel anyone who's creative has to do the two and some people act like oh if you love it it'll make money not necessarily i mean if you do a good job people will appreciate it doesn't mean it'll be profitable and sometimes you have to bridge the two how do you do that that, that is a fantastic question. And it's something that I have to think about a lot because I'm not just a designer, but I'm also a publisher. I, I, I do the two. And so there are definitely times where I have ideas where as much fun as I think I would have designing them and maybe playing them, I have some hesitancy as to whether or not it could actually be marketable. Um, the way I've described it, at least in our submission process, is that we look for themes that capture people's imaginations and that have hooks. And by hooks, I mean something that that grabs someone in and says, I want to learn more about this. 
And I try to have a hook in all aspects of the game. I try to have a thematic hook, like something that's unique and special that catches your eye. I like to have a component hook, like some really beautiful, special component that you want to pick up and touch and, and own, something that you like need to have. And then uh, um, a thematic hook, something that's at least somewhat unique. It doesn't mean that like, like The Walking Dead, for example. The Walking Dead took a, a genre that's been done many times, the zombie genre, but they took a different angle and it was very successful as a result because they took a different angle. I think Dead of Winter essentially did that for board yeah. games. Um, so yeah, the, Jose, the, there's definitely um, there's definitely some themes I've come upon where I I wanted to design a, a game about them, but it just didn't wasn't marketable. And there are other themes where I think that they could be very marketable, but I haven't figured out how to design the game in those themes yet. Oh, okay. And, and I will say this that reading the um the link onto your webpage as to reasoning why you you did not continue using kickstarter mm -hmm. was a really interesting read because so many people nowadays like they do these kickstarters and they're very successful and seeing how you broke it down bit by bit where like it's just so much of a harder process for you like yeah. was amazing i mean by far like it made so much sense and I remember like when you had Scythe on Kickstarter, you know, and things like that. And after reading that, I was like, wow, like to imagine myself in your shoes, like what that whole process was. Like if you wouldn't mind like going through uh, with that so our viewers who haven't been able to read the article would kind of get an idea, like just how tough it was to to make a go through that whole Kickstarter process. And then that difficulty of making the decision of like, OK, we're just going to do it straight ourselves. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a big part of it is that I my company exists because of Kickstarter. It would not exist without it. And it was a huge part of my company's brand, essentially, because for we I had uh, seven um, successful Kickstarter projects that ran not necessarily one after another, but like every six to 12 months, we had a new Kickstarter for a new product that we were coming out with. Um, and then we ran, or I ran the Scythe Kickstarter, which did the best of any of them. It was very successful. It definitely helped my company in a big way and get us, it made us a lot more visible to people. Um, but, and, and the project went very well, like it, not just the funding, but also the, the manufacturing, the shipping. It was one of these projects that went really, really well, fortunately. Um, but I ended up being like just more, uh, so part after after we fulfilled the project, that was when I really started to evaluate, like, do I want to do this again? Do I want to do Kickstarter again? Um, because there's still so many things I love about Kickstarter and that I've learned from it. But uh, I part of it was that it, despite everything going well, I saw kind of an ugly side of backers that really uh, it 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 really well, it affected me personally. It really stressed me out, but it also just made me it it was kind of unfortunate to see this uh, side of backers that I, I, in a project that was successfully funded and successfully delivered, like they got what they wanted and whatnot. Um, and that was part of it. Part of it was the risk that go into filling and shipping a project. We shipped over 21,000 copies of Scythe wow. people all around the world. It was a process I had done before several times. I knew how to do this process and it went very well for the most part. There were a few fulfillment centers that didn't do exactly what they should have. But I kind of realized along the way that if I'm sending hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory to a fulfillment center in France or the UK or Australia or Canada, mm -hmm. and that fulfillment center just decides not to ship those games or to not box them well or to send them to the wrong addresses, there's a huge risk there, um, opposed to me sending those games to just a few distributors and having those distributors send them to retailers and retailers to consumers, like the normal traditional mm -hmm. process. And also last, I, I know there's a lot here, but the, the last part is that it um, it took me, it takes a lot of time to run a Kickstarter project. There's a lot of planning that goes into it, actually running it and then fulfilling it takes, it's a full-time job for quite some time. And I already have an 80 hour a week job running Stonemaier Games. So adding that on top, I just got to the point where I was like, I, I'd rather just design games and run my company rather than also do those things and run mm -hmm. Kickstarters. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was interesting to to see, like you say, it's like there's people that will run a Kickstarter, it goes really great, and everything goes like as that perfect way that it could, and everybody's happy. And then you have that 
like that one little hiccup in your manufacturing process that you're then like, hey, everything's going to be late a month. And then you have like all those people that come out and like, oh, well, you promised it would be in da, 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 you know, such and such day. And I, I have seen that so many times in some Kickstarters and it's a shame. And like, you know, seeing that coming from the other side of the table, right. it was like, wow, like you don't really think about like how this affects the person on the other side. I was, yeah. Yeah. And it was really great to see that from your perspective. And I sat there and I said, you know, kudos to you that, you know, I mean, I, I also own the first little uh, treasure chest that you came out with. Uh-huh. And I mean, completely blown away by just how great those little component upgrades are. And I was just like, you know, here's this guy has a great company pumping out a bunch of great stuff. And like, I, I was rooting for you hundred percent from the moment I got down to play Viticulture. And I was like, man, this is, this is going to be amazing. Um, I appreciate that, Randy. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Now, a really tough question to start. Okay. By far. He was butting you up just to let you know that. No, okay. <laughs> um, right now, if you had to say, what would be your favorite board game that you ever played? Right now, um, I actually did a top 10 about two months ago. So I, I know this for sure. Um, I would say uh, Time Stories is my favorite game right now. Mm, have you guys played Time Stories? I have no. not, but I have heard a lot of really good things about it. Although I just picked up at PAX, unbelievably, a copy of Gloomhaven. Oh, nice. okay. I'm, I'm so looking forward to get that out to the table. Yeah. And I laughed at when I told my friends, like, yeah, I just picked up a game. They're like, really? What is this? I said, oh, it's Gloomhaven. And they're like, oh, really? How'd you get it there? I'm like, yeah, it was, it was a 25-pound box that I had to carry all the <laughs> way back. And they're like, wait, did you say 25 pounds? I'm like, yes, <laughs> 25 pounds. The storytelling in Gloomhaven reminds me a bit of time stories. Gloomhaven is much more of a tactical, uh, like tactical combat game, mm-hmm. but time stories. The Jose, you were saying you look for stories in games, and the, the stories told in time stories are absolutely amazing. Not just the, the stories the game tells, but the story that you tell through the game. It's a it's an amazing game. And I heard that each of the different stories that you play, it's just completely different from the one before. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. As overall, what I like to look at is like how games has changed and how people and culture has changed in gaming. So going back to 70s, 80s, when gaming was considered like, oh, that's only for a couple of nerds there. You know, it started was in, in colleges and then you had the arcades where it was like people going in. Then it kind of was like, oh, well, now it's for kids. You know, you have to be a little kid to like video games. And then it, you know, you you had all these companies trying to struggle with, do we want to sell it as a family computer or a console for games? And then you had people saying like, oh, you shouldn't play these games and so on. And then it got into pop culture. Then all of a sudden you had people who probably never played a video game. They want to jump in on the gaming culture so that they can say that they're part of this now. And now so many people grew up playing games that it's like almost anybody's played something from a Game Boy and on. That's video games, but in board games, it's interesting because that's always been kind of like right underneath. And it's like either you'll see it mentioned barely like a stereotype in a, in a movie. Oh, those are the Dungeons and Dragons kids. That's what they always bring up because that's the <laughs> only board game they've ever heard of or a tabletop game. But you've seen like in news reports that cafes are opening up. People are going and meeting where, you know, anywhere else, everyone's in their phones. Everything else is digital. Everything else is 3D, VR. But board games is making this resurgence. But at the same time, it's not in that pulp culture where everyone's just jumping on a bandwagon. You being in the business and just being part of this world, you know, what is your commentary and all that where it's popular and you have this huge influx of people who want to play this game, but it seems like right under the surface of pop culture and everything. You know, I I kind of like that we, it's flown a little bit under the radar. Um, but as a publisher, too, I, I, I wouldn't mind if it continued to grow and grow and grow, especially with the sheer number of games being released. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, one of the, the, the pros of that happening is that um, hopefully, and this is part of Kickstarter, too, and just the number of games, I, I hope that uh, these v- wide variety of games continue to invite people into the hobby. Like for me, I, I'm okay with anyone becoming a board gamer. That that's wonderful for me. If someone wants to spend their time playing board games, um, 
and it, whatever their motivation is for doing so, I, I, I'm okay with any motivation as long as they're they're having a good time. Uh, so I, I, I like that that, that it, it seems to continue to, to grow and grow and grow. Um, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like almost an extension of the old-fashioned family game night or family <laughs> gathering night. And you, it, it doesn't matter what the age. Like I've, I have friends who are 40, 50, and they'll get together, and we've played – board games and it's interesting because you could take someone who like i said they're on their phone 24 hours but then they'll sit there and they'll play a board game with no electronics and have fun and i think that that is something that is kind of understated in this world of technology that Mm -hmm. these games draw a lot of people in like someone can have a computer you know 20 you know ten thousand dollar computer but they love these board games and collect these board games and they keep you entertained and Mm -hmm. i think that's great i agree yeah, I, I think the the best thing going for the board gaming scene is you have such a wide berth of from really beginner to as strategic as you want to get it. So everybody can find that one niche that they want to get into. And it's amazing where I see, like, I'll have groups of friends that I'm like, okay, I can pick, you know, games like Carcassonne and Settlers of Catan, like a lot easier. And then I'll have another group of friends where it's like, we're going to play Eldritch Horror and Scythe and, you know, all these much more advanced games. Yeah. And I I kind of like agree with you. Or like, I like where it's just under the radar. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, you can just see the amount of games that are coming out every year. is just growing and growing and growing. And it's unbelievable just how... Like, it, they just keep coming out and people just buy them up. And I looked at it when I started getting into my collection as I can go and spend $60, $70 to go out with my wife and my friends to go see a movie and dinner. And that'll give us about two hours of entertainment. Right. Whereas I can spend the same amount on a board game, have them come over week after week after week, and we can spend hundreds of hours together. Yeah. You know? But that's that's been one of those things that is just amazing to me, just how the surgeons has been. Um, and it's 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 been like I said, you, you've had the hook, line and sinker <laughs> on every one of the games, which I will I I'll have to retract and say with my review for size where I thought that I said, like, it's a really, really good game. No, no, it is an amazing game because we played it with five people. Uh-huh. And oh my God, the difference that going from three to five makes, mm, it's yeah. just like, oh, wait a minute. There's like so many more people now and I have to deal with. And it was just mind blowing, mind blowing. Try playing with seven. With oh. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Well, and this is the thing that was funny is when we played with five, two people played the expansion races and oh, yeah. we realized like, wait a minute, they don't have to cross a river to get to the main land. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, when you go to like, have you been, have you interacted with people at like either conventions or other places where people would gather to talk about um, board games, tabletop games? What have been, I guess, some of the takeaway or like some of the good moments that you've had interacting with, you know, fans? Uh, that's a fun question. With, with fans of Stomar games specifically? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I go to two conventions a year. I go to one called Geekway to the West in St. Louis. It's a small convention, a couple thousand people, and it's just like a big game night that lasts four days. Like we just play games for four days. Very different than Gen Con, which is an exhibitor convention. At Geekway, um, so I'm just there to play games. I'm not there to promote anything. I just wander around and play games with strangers for four days, which I love. And it, I think what, one of my favorite things to happen at Geekway is um, so someone might come up to me and and this doesn't happen all the time, but it does feel good when they do. And they ask me to like sign their game. That That's a nice moment for me to to do that. But then usually I get to turn around and say, hey, do you just want to play a game together? Like, and it kind of breaks that wall down where I think they've they've seen me as a designer, as like someone separate. Um, and then then we just sit down at the table like friends and play a game. I, I love that moment of just remembering that we're just here to play games together and we're all just people who enjoy this hobby. I love that. At... Um, at, at Gen Con, uh, the interactions are very different, but some of the like my favorite are when uh, people tell me that uh, either their, um, it's usually their wife, actually. It's usually guys that come up to me and say, hey, like my, my wife never played games before. She, I couldn't get her to play any games. And then I introduced her to Viticulture or I introduced her to this game. Um, 
and I guess it can go both ways with with spouses and and you know all types of people have said this. But I, I love hearing when someone says, "Hey, your game has brought me closer to someone that I care about." That's like one of my favorite things that that I hear every now and then at conventions. Hmm. I think that is something specific to board games because as someone who's yeah. been to a lot of LAN parties and seeing how people act in video games, I mean, you can definitely, if you have a group of people who are friends beforehand and they come together and they play a video game, you can have a little bit of that. But yeah. with strangers, it's a little bit different, like especially as nowadays that you can connect and be anonymous. But right. with board games, it's like, I used to think before I learned about just going out and seeing people play board games, I always felt, oh, you have to be friends because how are you going to sit to get, sit down with someone you don't know and play a game where you have to have learn rules and do all this stuff? And I realized, no, actually, when you go to some of these conventions or you see people playing board games, they're more inviting. You know, yeah. it's almost like they took a lot of the best things about the video game culture and left out all, all the bad stuff. I yeah. mean, it's really amazing just to see how you could walk in total stranger doesn't matter what race creed color nothing hey that looks interesting can i play sure sit down and i'll show you and they'll teach you which is something especially in games you don't see uh, mm -hmm. in video games they'll scream at you if you make a mistake <laughs> and know the rules ahead of time in board games they're willing to teach you because they want to bring you into their world yes totally that's a great I, I like the comparison there yeah so now the rapid fire questions that are going to come now so okay. all right Coffee or tea? Uh, I was actually just talking about this today. I love sweet tea. So can uh, I say sweet tea? You can that, say that sweet counts. tea. Okay. That counts. <laughs> I'm in Miami, so we love the sweet tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, favorite flavor of ice cream, chocolate or vanilla? Uh, it's got to be chocolate. Got to be chocolate. Okay. Now towards the more controversial questions. Is ice cream cake considered a cake? Yes or no? Oh. Oh man, that's tough. I can see the size of the argument. I haven't ever debated that, but I can see that you don't actually bake it. So is it really a cake if you don't bake it? Um, but it does look like a cake and you eat, you slice it like a cake. I'm going to say, yes, it's a cake. Ah, so there we have it. Jamie has said it. It's just cake. <laughs> and the last ultra hardest controversial question is a hot dog a sandwich? I thought you were gonna ask that. <laughs> um, oh, I have to have questions here. <laughs> Um, so a sandwich to me is, uh, some sort of protein between two buns and so I, or two pieces of, well, I don't know, it's hard. I'll, I'll say yes. I'm yeah. sure okay. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. You yeah. have settled the argument that a hot dog <laughs> is considered a sandwich. I went to, so this is what's funny. I went to culinary school and I walked into work one day and they were like, Hey, you know, just blew it out. there like, is a hot dog a sandwich? And I'm like. Yeah, and they're like, "Why do you mean it? How could it be a sandwich?" I'm like, "It's a piece of meat between two pieces of bread. Like, even an open face sandwich, which is one piece of bread, is still a sandwich." <laughs> These are the same questions they asked me when they interviewed me for my job. I don't know. This is so weird. <laughs> uh, well, Jamie, I, oh, let me yeah. ask you guys this before we go, because I, yeah. I I had a very interesting burger the other day where the buns were. It was a donut cut in half, and the mm -hmm. donut was, was the bun. What's the what's the most outlandish burger that you've ever eaten? Mm. Damn, that's a good one. It could um, even just be like one crazy ingredient that was on it or one weird thing. So there's two things that I've had before. One was I've had the the donut burger. Okay. Um, the only other weirder thing, well, so kind of three. One was a donut bun. I've I've. Uh, took a bite out of they essentially did the same thing but with a cinnamon bun oh. instead of a donut which was interesting yeah um but craziest ingredient i've ever tried in a burger was um sliced truffles in oh. a burger yeah so it was just like crazy just meat and then sliced truffle and then I, i'm trying to remember like it was like a gorgonzola type cheese so like a really strong cheese with that earthiness yeah. but yeah that was, that, was, that was a beautiful thing of culinary school. Got to try a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. like, I can't. I'm not going to ever pay money to do that. For me, the strange one I had was they, it was almost kind of like, um, almost like a calzone. But what they did is they, they, they cooked the burger, but inside the burger was already bacon and cheese. So they cooked it inside the burger. Mm. Then what they did is they baked like almost a little crust around it. So it was almost like a, 
hamburger pot pie pocket. I don't know what it was, but it was really interesting because it was like everything was contained. It was almost like a hot right. pocket with a burger inside. So That's to me, fun. that was like just intriguing because of the design aspect. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only other thing I've ever had that was like a great burger was they call it the Juicy Lucy where they put the cheese inside the burger. Yeah. And I think what was hilarious about it is I've never eaten a burger that I got a warning when I got served the burger. They like serve the burger like, yeah, you're going to want to wait about five, 10 minutes before you bite into that. And we're like, huh? And they're like, yeah, trust me. And not all the cheese falls out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Jamie, thank you. Thank you so much for spending the time to come with us and chat with us. Uh, it was really, really great to finally get to connect with you after all these weeks that we were going back and forth. Persistence yeah. pays. <laughs> <laughs> And you are you're, for this show. You're our first guest, so yes, oh, you have that honor. You have the honor. honor yeah. Yes, um, but thank you once again. Um, keep up the great work coming out with the great games. I look forward to uh, that expansion for Scythe. Like I swear, as soon as I hear it's on sale, it's like, oh, I'm getting it. <laughs> um, but thank you, thank you very much. Um, I hope that we can connect together in the future again. Bring yeah. you on again, and we can have another chat. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank All you right, very guys. much. Yeah. yeah, nice meeting you, Randy. Jose, nice take care. You. Take care. <laughs> nice meeting you. Well, there you go, guys. Our very, very special guest of Jamie Stegmeyer. Um, he, let me tell you, he, that guy is everything that I had heard about him of being the nicest guy, coolest guy. Like, it's true, hundred percent. Amazing designer. I'm, I'm still awestruck of like the fanboyism of it. Hey, for our first interview, I think that went well. I think so, too. Good questions, too. Our, our fans way. will tell us if, if if they don't agree. So you got to tell us. How do we yeah. do? Do we how do, do we good do? or what? So. I had the fanboy questions. Jose brought in the rough, tough, like, this is, I'm a, I'm an, <laughs> I am an interviewer. I will ask the good questions. Listen, I admit, um, I knew you were going to do good. There's no question about that. But I was just curious because when I first started the Obsolete Gamer Show and I first interviewed people, it was crazy. Because first of all, I butcher names where having a last name LaRock is one of those things where I hate. So I always hate, like if I, I'm always thinking like, what should I ask? How should I ask? Which is funny because sometimes you'll see people say, especially like, you know, you have these uh, YouTube channels or Twitch channels and they'll be like, oh, well, that's so easy. Why, why do you get to do that? Trust me. It's not easy preparing for an interview, reaching out to someone, talking to them, getting everything together. It's, it so, gets to you. Here, here's the funny thing. The whole time leading up to this is his last name Stegmeyer, not Stonemeyer. And what's the first thing I say? Hey, it's Jody Stone and Jamie Stonemeyer. I'm like, no, wait, it's Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Day. I've done the same thing. Oh. I've said the name in my head like 50 times. And then when it comes out, I still mispronounce it. I'm just like, oh. just kill me. Just yeah. kill it. But guys, I really, really hope that you enjoyed episode 10 of Geek Salad. We will soon, as soon as I can get the videos over to JA, have a PAX East special, which oh, I, I have so much to tell you guys, and we'll do just an episode just on that. Um, but it was amazing. Um, and once again, thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie Stegmeyer, thank you for coming on, <laughs> being our guest. Um and, and by the way, just as a side to anyone out there who's watching the show, of course, thank you for that. But yes. also, you know, we do want to continue to, you know, profile tabletop game designers, people like that. So if there's someone that you'd like out to, us to reach out to, let us know and we'll definitely give it a shot. So that's why we need your comments and feedback so that we know what to bring you, what you guys like. Because we're going to bring you what we like, but we'd like to give you like a little bit of what you like to Yes. So guys, as always, keep on gaming, have fun, take care out there. Peace. Hey guys, listen, you like the games, you like the interviews, you like the shows. How about you click on that subscribe button and also give us a like. We really need your help here. huh?